All right, here with uh, Juno, who I've been referring to as Jordan. And uh, this is um, Zoe. I almost forgot that again. I did forget. I couldn't hear your mom saying it. In this video, we're going to go over some tips that you can use if you have a dog that has difficulty paying attention to you. Now, you can see both these are Lyman owners. They're very high energy dogs, especially her. So if, you're going to, if you have high energy dogs, you want to exercise your dogs to set them up for success. Most of us don't exercise our dogs, then we, we take them out on the walk for the exercise, then we wonder why they can't listen to us. Well, I've got crescendo of energy exploding through my brain. Most people never consider that you can actually exercise your dog before you exercise your dog. So maybe we take her out and back and play fetch. She doesn't like to play fetch, maybe we do some set games, some training, uh, some things along those lines. After exercise, your dog needs 10 minutes to recover, then you can go to do the next thing. If you go straight from exercise to the next thing, they'll probably behave the worst they possibly can. So always give them that 10 minutes and different amounts of exercise for different activities. So you wanna find the Goldilocks amount. So there might be a certain number of uh, uh, fetches that the dog does before a walk and a number of fetches you do before a guest comes over. And might, might, those might be different numbers. Now, uh, a couple things. Um, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, uh, you can stay where, where you're at, but I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna have you guys look. So can you see her pupils? Are very dilated. Now let's get, let's try to do this over here. See these pupils? Not as dilated. So dilated pupils is an indication the dog is over aroused. Um, now is it bad to have dilated pupils? No, but it means I'm going to pay a little bit more attention. Recognize your dog's body language. Now it's pretty easy to see her body language right here is a very excitable body language, but you look at the contrast there. Yeah. Jordan Juno, your body language is a lot different. So just learning how to recognize those body language and being able to read your dog is really important. Now, I like to do something called, we do something called training for attention. Now we were using a clicker, and if you use a clicker, make sure you plan to load the clicker first so the dog understands what it is. So you can see that I've got great attention, but look at that tail. The energy's going really high. So sit. Sit. Now, now, this is not ideal to do with both dogs at the same time. I can't do anything right now because they they really need to be together. Uh, but if you're doing this, I would have one of you walking one of the dogs and you're looking with the other dog because you see that kind of cascade and they're trying to get the other dog's energy or a dog, other dog's treat. So I'm going to have two treats right here. So what I'm going to do is say sit. She can smell that I have another one. Down. So I'm slowing down. Yes, I saw that, Juno. I'm sorry. Um, I'm slowing down the do treat delivery. Now, you, normally when you're first teaching a dog, you want to be really fast. Sit. That fast. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to elongate and have her stay in that sit for a little longer. So I say sit. It's within two seconds is okay. She knows I have a treat, so I've got her attention. I'm going to buy a second or two of time. And ask for a down. Give her that treat. Now, is she calm? No. But she's calmer. This is a process. Now, I do something called training for attention in our puppy classes. Um, a lot of times when we go outside, the dog won't listen to us. And right now, I'm inside. I'm like a perfect tender. I've got great treats. There's no squirrels or anything in here. There's no reason for her to be distracted. I take her outside. There's smells of things. There's birds in the air. There's squirrels. There's traffic. There's people. All of a sudden, I'm on sensory overload, and I can't listen to you. A lot of us take our dogs from a really easy situation to a very complex or busy situation and wonder why they can't listen. Well, we don't do this with students or any, anything that we're doing. We go gradually step by step. And if we take a step and it's too much, we back up to a previous step. And we went over something called the relaxation protocol. I'm going to talk a little about it in, in, our, uh, in the Roadmap to Success video for this one. It's a great thing to, uh, to work on your dogs because it does help them practice calming down. It helps the humans practice the little steps. So what I could do is I'm going to ask for a sit. Give her that treat. This is all about not being excited, and that was not a good demonstration right there. If you only have one dog, what I'm gonna do for, uh, for clicking for attention or training for attention is sit. Sit. And I'm gonna do this five or six times throughout the house. If I go right outside, then they're gonna, it's all out the window. So what I wanna do is practice in the house and just grab yourself like 15 treats and only one of the dogs walk around the house 
ask for a sit. As soon as the dog sits, click, give them that treat, take a couple of steps, walk in another room, sit or lay down or whatever it is the dog wants. So you're doing all these different activities and the dog's following you around. She's like, I'm waiting for you to tell me to do something. As soon as I do it, you give me a treat. I'm motivated to want to do what you want. So I practice maybe for 10, 12 treats, wander around the house without any distractions and I'm building a foundation. And after I've done that maybe uh, two or three times a day for a day or two, then I would go maybe to the deck. Now, if the dog is too energetic, then I might exercise the dog first before we do this exercise, give 10 minutes rest. Then I might go outside and try on the deck. If that doesn't work and the dog still can't listen, then I would maybe start in, exercise the dog first, sit, give them the treats, walk a step or two close to the door, repeat, walk a step or two close to the door. So you're basically kind of warming them up and getting kind of in that rhythm. And then I ask to go to the door, I say sit, they sit, I open the door. They're staying here instead of running through there because I'm giving out all these treats and they know that's the case. I go right outside the door and I ask them to sit again. Now we're in the environment that's a little bit more distracting, but we're just a little bit in that environment. So the energy crescendo isn't super high. And so I'm carrying over the listening to me and being motivated and rewarded for listening to me from inside to outside. And maybe I only do two or three outside and I bring them back to, and I can go in and out the door and I'll notice the dog's gonna have a little bit better retention inside. As soon as I go outside, it's a little bit harder. But as we practice this, we should see the carryover from the inside control starting to go outside. And then maybe you go five steps outside, 10 steps outside. Then maybe you walk around in your yard and your dog's paying attention, you're just wherever you go, sit and then walk and take a couple more steps. We're giving your dog a motivation to listen to us instead of looking for everything else. Because in this case, these dogs, guardians, do what a lot of my clients' guardians do, is when they're walking, we're, we're keeping the leash short, we're not letting them go on the yards or sniff or do what they want to do, we're just trying to walk them in a straight line, which is not a very dog-centric thing. Dogs almost never walk in a straight line. And so again, it's very boring and they don't want to do it and they get frustrated on the walk. So if instead, we're a little unpredictable. Um, that causes the dog to be a little bit more interesting. So there's another game that we do. Um, I'm gonna actually have our cameraman stand up and go, and keep filming. And this is kind of an orientation game. So what I'm gonna do is I've got these treats and I wanna throw one over here. Can you see the floor over here? Yep, now I can. Okay, so I'm gonna throw a treat. <laughs> Hardwood floors make it a little easier. Do you look at me? I'm looking, I throw another one over there. So I'm waiting for the dog to look at me. As soon as it looks at me, I click to say that's what I wanted, and I throw another treat somewhere else. And what is the dog doing? It's practicing disengaging from the environment, looking up at me, and then I'm throwing another treat in the environment. So I'm rewarding the dog for checking in with me. So this is a great activity that you can eventually, so you do maybe the sits, the downs, or whatever it is inside, then you go outside. Maybe you start playing the orientation game in the yard. What are we doing? We're helping the dog practice disengaging from their environment, looking at us and getting rewarded for doing so. And then we let them go back to doing what they want to do. Normally we say, come, they come to us. We come, bring them inside and close the door and it represents the end of fun. Well, why would I listen to you next time? It's always your buzzkill. So looking at you means that we're gonna play more of the game and then more of the game. And then we walk to a different location. And we're doing this in your, at first maybe on your deck. Then you're doing it in your backyard. Then you're doing it in your front yard. You can do it in your front yard on a leash. And so now the dog's checking in with you. Now, um, I'm gonna show you another little, and I'm gonna use the clicker to mark this. So I'm just dis I'm distracting them to get them to look down. So as soon as she looked at me, I clicked and gave her a treat. So my hand is down here. She's trying to get it. But she's not looking at me. She's objectifying the treat. If I give it to her, then all she just cares about is the treat. What we do is make sure you watch your dog like a hawk. I'll anchor it to my apron. Thanks. That's her marker word. Don't click and use the marker at the same time. So basically, I'm rewarding her for looking up at me. This is something I'd like the guardians to do in terms of celebrating in the house. So you're watching TV, the dog comes up and stares at you, there's a worm around her eyes, but nice and pet your dog. And if you know your dog's gonna do it, then I might go something like this and, and say, focus. I knew she was gonna look up at me, so I snuck the cue word of focus in then she looked up at me, I clicked to let her know that's what I wanted and I gave her a treat. So now she, looking at David gets me a treat? Well, then I'm more likely to do that again. And when I'm checking in with my handler, I'm not as involved in my environment. And I'm checking in to see, are you giving me a little, little treats? 
Now, a lot of the, guardi the guardians here mentioned, a lot of my guardians say the same thing, is I only give my dogs treats when they're training. Rewarding your dog with a treat, like I said, for the orientation game, or just looking at us, causes them to do it more. The more they practice looking at us, the more they're gonna continue looking at us, and it's easier for us to do that because it becomes a habit for them, and it's rewarding for them, so they're motivated. Right now, when, when she goes on a walk, her motivation is looking at anybody but her guardians because they don't let her go anywhere she, where she wants to go. And looking at them doesn't get her anything. But pulling over here gets me to sniff the squirrel urine. Getting me to pull over here gets me to bark at the rabbit or whatever it is. So those things all validate and reward your dog. But listening to us doesn't do anything. As a matter of fact, it often punishes them. So instead, just have the treats and don't hold the treats. I'll just give you another example right here. So I've got, and these are really high value treats. If you're using treats that are so high value that the dog doesn't care about anything else, go to a lower level treat. There you go. So the idea for this is again, we were gonna reward our dog for checking in with us. Make sure that we back up a step. If you get, if you go from the backyard to outside the backyard or your dog can't listen, you might actually, if this is the gate, this is the fence, you might practice in the, uh, in the yard, out of the yard, in the yard, in the yard again, now out of the yard for two steps. And then go back in the yard, one step, now on three steps out of the yard. So you're gradually ebbing and flowing. <laughs> you look like you're dancing with me. Um, but you're ebbing and flowing and you're helping the dog practice. I mean, look at how much great attention I have. Now I'm giving really good treats, but these, dogs, especially her, she was bouncing off the walls, going all over the place. But I'm a doggy slot machine now. I am the giver of all these amazing treats. And why wouldn't I want to listen to David? There's something in on it for me. Most of us don't give our dog anything to be in on it. And you could also do a variation like that where I'm rewarding her for coming back to me. Or I could just go like that. She looks, let's go, let's go another one. She looks, I can do weird things like this. We call that a funder. Um, so what did she do? She ran between my, between my legs. Is that something that's important for training? No, but I'm unpredictable now. And who knows, David might do some weird thing with his foot and there's a treat at the end of it. So what am I doing? I'm practicing looking at David, paying attention to David and being rewarded for doing so. So if your dog doesn't listen to you, ask yourself these questions. Am my dog, have I set my dog up to fail by not getting enough exercise? Have I set it up to fail because I put it in an environment that is too stimulus rich and haven't helped the dog practice up to that level yet. And if either one of those is the case, then go back, exercise your dog, get the right amount of exercise, give them that break, and then find some exercise, some things your dog can do to check in with you, whether it's rewarding eye contact, playing the orientation game, or uh, just doing a lot of sits and downs or hand targeting or whatever it is, and give your dog that motivation to check in with you and always back up to a less stimulus rich environment it might take you a lot of practice, but eventually you get to the point where you get a marching man walking around you, your dog's like, I don't care because they don't have any treats. David's the one with the treats. All right, let's see if we can get you guys to orientate better for the camera. Sit. Can you come over here? Come here. <laughs> well, this is Juno. Yes, and this is Zoe. And these are some tips you can use if you have a dog that has difficulty listening to you in stimulus-rich environments.